playing they're certainly playing better defensively they certainly understand the system more they certainly know what they what's expected out of them and and they've come together and and i think the whole team has done that uh you you kind of said in the beginning of the question about nick sirianni being the best of the rookie coaches and i hadn't even thought about that and that's very interesting Mega Mac guys here on Birds 365. We got one of our faves from down in uh, South Florida. He's looking good. He's got the uh, cutoff shirt on. He's ready to rock with us today. Rob Mighty from the Associated Press here joined us on Birds 365. Rob, how big a Madden game player are you? Were you? Have you been a guy who's played the Madden game over the years? Not a single time in my life. I, I don't have <laughs> I haven't played wow. a video game since Tech Mobile, um, which <laughs> I, I don't know how long. But uh, John Madden for me was just simply the, the I don't I didn't know John Madden the head coach. I knew John Madden the broadcaster. John Madden the broadcaster was absolutely the best that there there ever was, and and you knew it was an important game if John Madden was there, and he was fun, he was entertaining, he was informative, he was you know usually when people pass away you hear nice things about them, and I think. In John's case, they're all true. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, we kind of reflect on someone and just always point out uh, the great things about them. And, and, and that's, that's what you should do. But in John's case, man, uh, everything about this guy w- was uh, put out there yesterday. And, and he's been eulogized and, and thought about it in just so many ways. And it, it's pretty cool. I saw a video clip yesterday of him talking about Brady in his – first game of the season after they won the Super Bowl. And I'm sure you guys probably saw this clip where he says, you know, I, I'm probably going to take, I don't want to say this, but he reminds me of Joe Montana. Well, look, look, look what happened. <laughs> he surpassed Joe Montana. So uh, he was also a little bit clairvoyant there. He was, he was right on in his observations. Yeah, Rob, the amazing part you mentioned, the guy's a Hall of Fame coach and he retired very young. Yeah. I think I, w- I was telling Jody, people think Sean McVay, uh, was, you know, the first wonderkin. He got a head coaching job at 33 with John Madden, turned it into a Hall of Fame coach, retired very early, somehow became a better broadcaster than a coach, and then at least to a, a, a newer generation, he became an icon because of a video game to the point where you just say Madden, and it's like yeah. Madonna or Prince or... It, to, to be able to go into three different phases, um, we use that term icon, which is overused in my estimation, not for John Madden. He might be the biggest name in football history. When you consider the encompass of everything he did and kept himself relevant until he was 85 years old when he passed away, relevant every step of the way. Most recognizable name? John, yeah. right? Yeah. If you say, if you say, I thought it was pretty cool. How I didn't realize this, and I read it yesterday, was that when they were putting together the Madden game, he had he he did not want his name attached to it if it was a six on six or seven on seven game. He demanded that it's got to be an eleven on eleven Madden game, and, and that to me was in, it. It just epitomized who, who John Madden was. Even if it was a video game, he wanted it to be as realistic as football as possible. And he made it that when he broadcast uh, week in and week out before he ever got to putting together video games. And uh, he was much watched TV every single week when he became uh, the Sunday night, Monday night guy. You knew you were getting him anyway. But prior to that, you found out what game he was uh, doing and you hoped it was your local game uh, during that week. All right. Speaking of local, let's get in to the birds. They gonna make the playoffs on Sunday, or are we gonna have to wait another week? There's a couple things that have to happen for the Eagles to make the playoffs, starting with a win over the Washington football team. You think uh, all the dominoes fall this week and the Eagles are in the postseason before we ever get to the final week of the season, Robbie? Guys, I think when we look at all those equations, Minnesota losing to Green Bay is very likely. They should lose to to Green Bay. San Francisco beating Houston should happen. But the toughest part of the equation for me is going to be the Eagles going to Washington and beating a team that I think Ron Rivera is going to have the Washington football team playing with pride, playing with 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 heart, 
playing to uh, avenge some of their recent losses. And, and I think it's going to be a tough road for the Eagles to get their end of what needs to happen to get that uh, playoff spot secured. I think all the other pieces will fall into place, but I think it's going to be a struggle for the Eagles uh, on, on Sunday against Washington. And if they, if they can pull it off, then uh, all those other dominoes should fall into place, which will make things so much less interesting in week 18 if you're facing yeah. the Cowboys and it doesn't – you're already locked into the seven seed. Now there's a, there's a way where the Eagles could be playing for the six seed. And I got to look at, well, San Fran would have to lose one of the next two and the Eagles would have to win out and then they could – get the the sixth seed but it really doesn't matter if you're the sixth seed you're the seventh seed especially the way the top is so jumbled I don't know who you want to face whether it's Dallas whether it's uh the Rams or Tampa Bay Tampa Bay is so banged up so beat up right now and they just keep losing key player after key player it looks like they're going through a little bit of a COVID thing right now that might be the team you want to face because you already played them earlier in the season. So you put your work in Dallas, of course, you should know very well. And then the Rams, I, I, I would always enjoy seeing Sean McVay suffer a first round exit because I, I still think he, he's one of the most overrated coaches we've seen. Yeah. Um, if you're, and speaking of, I don't think he is overrated. And I think we have a large enough sample size, Rob, to, look at this rookie head coaching class. And I think the Eagles have the best of the rookie head coaches. But if you're, if you're Nick Sirianni, um, it's not his fault uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but how do you evaluate your team when the opposing quarterback is Garrett Gilbert on a week uh, preparation, Jake Fromm, I've never seen a less prepared quarterback in my life until maybe Ian Book on the next day. Um, <laughs> and I still think Ian Book was better. I, I, How do you evaluate your team? Can you get caught up in, let's face it, a stroke of luck? Uh, do you have, how do you keep your team focused? How do you evaluate your team? Is this real? Is it fool's gold? Be one of those games. And then, and then the quarterback's, that during this little bit of a run, Jared Goff and Garrett Gilbert and Trevor Simeon and Zach Wilson, who had a pretty good game from a fantasy standpoint. I remember that because I had to pick him up that week. I had a guy <laughs> on five. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you look at the Jake Fromm, you look at these guys and you go, well, it, you want to win those games, you want to play well in those games, and you want to dominate. And for the most part, they have defensively. So – it's better than the alternative. It's better than going out there and Jake Fromm and, and you have to win a 35-30 game because he lit you up. No, you, you held him uh, and knocked him out of the game and, and, and benched him and had uh, Mike Lennon come in. So uh, I heard Jonathan Gannon say yesterday how was well, the season goes. It might have been your question, John. You framed it that way to, to Jonathan. How are you going to evaluate? And, and, and he said – as the season goes on, your guys are more familiar with the system. They're getting better. So I would have rather seen this team face the elite quarterbacks in the second half of the season, and then you get a more accurate read on the defense and how well they're playing. Because if, if you're doing better uh, in the second half of the season, then you sh it stands to reason maybe you should have fared better against the Brady's and the Mahomes and the Prescott's and everyone else. But as it is right now, we'll see in the playoffs because I don't think you're going to face no chump quarterbacks in the playoffs. So that'll be interesting to see how the Eagles do. But I think they are playing – they're certainly playing better defensively. They certainly understand the system more. They certainly know what they what's expected out of them, and, and they've come together. And, and I think the whole team has done that. Uh, you you kind of said in the beginning of the question about Nick Sirianni being – the best of the rookie coaches. And I hadn't even thought about that. And that's very interesting because all I remember is when Nick Sirianni was hired, he was supposedly the worst of all of them. And yeah. here we go. He may have, he may have ended up being the best. And I didn't think he was the worst at the time. And I don't think uh, I, I got to look at it. That's a pretty, that's a, that's pretty insightful. He was the biggest reach at the time. And guess what? The reach seems to have paid off for the Philadelphia Eagles. I right, know this is a hypothetical question but it could become an actual question as per Monday. 
if the Eagles get what they need done and everything else happens, that they lock in a spot for the playoffs uh, going into week 18, game number 17. How does Nick Sirianni handle that? Uh, you watched Andy Reid for all oh, those many years, and Eagles were always going into the playoffs. And several times over the course of Andy's tenure here in Philly, Eagles didn't need the game. They couldn't move up. They couldn't move down. There wasn't a significant change in the standings and or their positioning. And Andy Reid was a very conservative guy. He'd pull his stars off the field. He'd make sure they were in civvies as a matter. He wouldn't even let them dress to make sure that they didn't get out there and get hurt. The Eagles are a team, as John just pointed out, that are still probably proving things to themselves. We got a chance to play against the Dak Prescott the last week of the season. Maybe you take that opportunity and go, let's go out there and show that we can beat a good quarterback. But there's a possibility that you may have to play Dak Prescott seven days later in the first Mm -hmm. round of the playoffs down in Dallas. So there's a lot of different permutations here. How's Nick Sirianni going to handle the last game of the season if the Eagles already locked into a playoff spot? I think he handles it like this. Jalen, take a seat. It's Minshew time. Fletch, take a seat. Jason Kelsey, sit this one out. I, I think if you go in a game like this, as much as you would want to give the Dallas Cowboys the best effort and try and knock because they could be fit, they could be playing for the one seed, the two, three, whatever they're they're, they're in. Now, of course, only the one gets the buy. So I don't know how much they're going to care two or three. They ought to because if one get you want you should want to beat two because if one somehow gets knocked off, now two is going to host the NFC Championship game. So I think that matters. I I think two, three, four does matter more so than six or seven. But I, I, I would take the Andy Reid route, and I think a lot of NFL coaches have been doing that uh, lately. Maybe play the guys for a series or two, but so much wrong can happen. And now you're also dealing with COVID, and, and uh, the NFL uh, at least reduced the guidelines from 10 days to five days yesterday. But if somebody tests on a Wednesday or a Thursday, now they're out because it's still five days. So – it's it's a it's a very fluid situation with COVID protocols. You don't want to add injuries to that, but I, I'm more than certain that the Eagles would take the the very conservative approach and sit most of their starters out. You still got to field the team. You still got to play a football game, but uh, I would anticipate they do something like that and, and say, "Hey, let let's go get the backups out." They're already back, so banged up at running back. Uh, what, what do you? It's carry on Johnson game. Hey, who just? got picked back up. That's about all you could do there. You got to preserve Boston Scott and and Kenneth Gainwell. So that's going to be interesting. That's another reason why I think it'll be tough on on Sunday against Washington, the the injury situation and running back. Rob, uh, you mentioned the COVID uh, change, which just happened uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, For those who don't know, Rob covers uh, the league nationally for AP and check out his AP pro football podcast um do you obviously it's too early but when when you tap into your sources around the league how upset are teams like washington new orleans going to be fighting for playoff spots and at the worst possible Mm -hmm. time they have these COVID outbreaks over 20 players there's been more teams with unvaccinated players and all of a sudden late in the season with the playoffs looming Looks like even unvaccinated guys are going to be able to get back. Carson Wentz being a perfect example this week, testing positive on Monday under the new rules. He should be able to play if he's feeling well on game day. How are, how are leagues and organiz- how are teams and organizations going to look at this from a competitive advantage standpoint of what they did, what it did against them versus how it's going to help other teams. You know, I, I spoke to one of those teams or, or a couple people from one of those teams, and, and the feeling was that they understand with this COVID situation, it's so fluid, it's constantly changing. You look at the protocols, I, I believe it's now three weeks in a row that I've been dealing with revised stories on revised, like they constantly are updating and changing. So, 
uh, it, it's they couldn't have done this before the CDC issued those guidelines. And for a while there, the NFL had been doing more than the CDC recommended when they yeah. were doing testing, right, uh, uh, of players on a weekly basis because the CDC doesn't even recommend vac- fully vaccinated people don't have to be tested unless there's some symptoms. And the NFL was just doing testing weekly, and they finally reduced that to targeted testing, which is still more than the CDC recommendations. So I think teams feel when it comes to the COVID situation, it's so fluid, it's constantly changing that although it's kind of not fair that Washington had to go into a game with a Garrett Gilbert, and then you look at the Chargers who are missing so many important players. I know they lost to a Texans, Texans team that was also decimated by COVID-19, but their guys weren't uh, – uh, other than Brandon Cooks, it wasn't a big deal for some of those players who were out. And meanwhile, you had star guys on the chart. And all, all of these uh, different – the Saints on Monday night, all everything that they had to all of them go through, uh, I think they understand because COVID is it's just constantly changing. And I think we're going to get to a point, guys, where actual playoff games. You don't want to be in a playoff situation. All of a sudden, quarterbacks knocked out the day of, the day before, two days before that, and now teams thrown into – a big game and, and you're going to have to see, I, I forgot who Patrick Mahomes backup is in Kansas city, but whoever it is, you, you know, you know, I don't want to have to see Lane Gabbard Chad step in for Tom Brady. Yeah. Chad Haney in, in KC, Blaine Gla- Gabbert in Tampa or, or wh- whoever else it may be anywhere. You don't want to see that. And, and hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but, but there's that fear. And, and I, I'm, I'm starting to, to question, I think I'm going to do something today on, on I heard Nick Sirianni on Monday say how he's going to take extra precautions. I wonder yeah. what coaches are going to do above and beyond the league mandates because I think it would be prudent to go and do different takes, take measures out of precaution above and beyond what the league is mandating. And and, and under the, the new protocols that came out yesterday, they can't eat together, masks everywhere, uh, 15 people limited in the weight room, strongly encourage players not to go anywhere on a road trip, uh, strongly encouraged, but not forbid it. I think I think coaches have to step in and say, "Hey, when we go on uh, a road a road game this weekend, this is a business trip. Eat in a hotel. Don't leave the room. You don't have to party. You don't have to do any of that. This is something that should be incumbent upon coaches to take upon themselves and, and decide if the league's not going to mandate some of these extra necessary steps. Let's do it because we can't go through this." the final week of the season into the playoffs. Chad Henney still uh, living off that key fourth down conversion he got in the playoffs last year. That was a nervy throw that he had to make to keep Kansas City going. So good for Chad Henney. Um, Robbie, you're a couple of years young, younger than both John and myself, uh, but you're a guy who's also been watching football for a pretty long period of time. This, because we can tell like, just by what you said about Madden, this week – the Hall of Fame semifinalists will be cut from 25 down to 15. There are a couple of people with eagle ties, Eric Allen, Ricky Waters, a guy like Sam Mills. Now, this is probably before your time going back to the USFL winning championship with the Stars. And Eddie George, a guy who I met in Philly at a charity thing. is a Philly uh, local guy, but did his uh, work uh, out of town for both his great college career and his pro career. The two guys that we recognize as Eagles, Ricky Waters and Eric Allen, think either one of them make it, make the cut from 25 down to 15 and are a Hall of Fame finalist? I don't, I don't think Ricky Waters is going to make that cut. I, I do believe his numbers are, are deserve strong consideration. Eric Allen, to me, is a very interesting case. I, I do think Eric Allen is very worthy of, of Hall of Fame uh status and and to see you know Jared, i haven't looked at the rest of whoever else is on the list i know i talked to a couple guys early in the process who was on i know matt burke was on it initially and and some of these other players who who were on it but i i think eric allen deserves some strong consideration i do remember the philadelphia stars and i, I believe their quarterback was a guy named chuck fusina chuck right? fusina yeah. yes the well Chuck Cena led Philadelphia Stars, yeah, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, what a great, so, what a great uh, team, Sam, Calvin Sam Bryant, Rose, man. Wow. Yeah. 
William Fuller, that was the best. Yeah. Uh, Scott that, Fitzke, was he on that team? Yes, yeah, Scott Fitzke. Yeah. They had a great team. Jim Mora, yeah, by the Jim way. Mar Jim Mora, uh, head coach. Yeah. How many, how many titles did they win? Didn't they win more than two. one? They won two. They yeah, won they one in Philadelphia, so, then they, they won that, one in Baltimore. Yeah. They went to Baltimore and won one. Uh, eventually – I think Eric Allen is going to get into the Hall of Fame. I just don't know if that's going to be this year. Hey, Rob, speaking of Hall of Fame, uh, I want to give a, a plug uh, to your Faith on the Field uh, show and podcast because uh, – and that's syndicated. People should check that out. But you you were able to get an interview with uh, Kurt Schilling um, and obviously him yeah. in the Baseball Hall of Fame. So that was uh, really, really interesting and such a, a, a you know, lightning rod because of some of his personal views and, you know, voters in that sport taking that into account versus what just happens on the field. I always look at your Hall of Fame ballot. You're a Hall of Fame voter in baseball. To me, you're always very, very fair. Um, what do you think of Kurt Schilling and his Hall of Fame? Uh, uh, and 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 what's going on in, in his candidacy? Yeah, I, I reached out to Kurt because I was struggling with my ballot. There's more than 10 players that I feel belong in the Hall of Fame, and you, there's a 10-max rule. You have to narrow it down. So he had said he didn't want to be on the ballot, and he doesn't care if people vote for him. And, and, and I wondered, should I spend a vote on Kurt Schilling, or should I give it to someone else? So we sat down and had a, a really long, fascinating conversation. And uh, I, I think when you look at Kurt Schilling and the way I vote, I look at everybody, I look at their numbers, and I believe that's the fairest way to decide who belongs in the Hall of Fame. And then this would be something that Phillies fans may get upset about, but compare Kurt Schilling's numbers to Roy Halladay's numbers. And Roy was a first ballot Hall of Famer. And, and, and Kurt's numbers are above and beyond. He should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer. You can't keep a guy out of the Hall of Fame because you disagree with his political views. And, and I'm not a political person. I never have been a political person. And, and I have great peace of mind having no political affiliation because I watch everybody get all angry and fight with each other and everything else. And I'm in the background going, y'all can say this, <laughs> you, you can say that. I could care less. Because I just don't care about I don't I don't I look at it from I look at everything from a faith perspective. I only trust in one person. I don't trust in a politician who's who's going to put my hope put my hope in, a, in in anybody. I put my hope in in, in the Lord. So uh, I had this conversation with Kurt. It was it was a pretty good one. I came out of it and uh, I I ended up saying, all right, well, I'm I'm going to still maintain Kurt. He he didn't he didn't back off where he stood. I got this sense that it does matter to him. It, it does matter to him. And, and it, it, he, he just belongs in the Hall of Fame. And this is his final year of eligibility. And the same to me for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. I'm I with shouldn't you. even have to be – I shouldn't have to struggle over this ballot and go, oh, well, these, these guys are still on this damn ballot. They should have been in five, six, seven. They should have been in the first time. It's another thing I think is stupid. Oh, a guy's not a first ballot Hall of Famer, but eight years later – after not throwing another pitch or not getting another single, double, triple, or homer, all of a sudden he's now good enough to be a Hall of Famer. What happened in those eight years? And Kurt played this game with me. Uh, Kurt himself didn't think he was a Hall of Famer. He said, if, if I'm bestowed that honor, I'll accept it. But he played a game with me. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, I'm going to give you some names. And he's like, Babe Ruth. I'm like, yes. Uh, Mariano Rivera, absolutely. Uh, and then he goes, Roy Halladay. And I paused. And it wasn't that I didn't think Roy is, but I just paused for a second. He goes, as soon as you pause about a name, people pause when you say somebody's name. That, that guy should not be a Hall of Famer in his book of Hall of Fame. And he's like, people pause at my name. They may want to look at the numbers more. And uh, I thought that was interesting. But I thought in his case, he, he's certainly worthy when you look at his. And one of the greatest postseason pitchers, 11 and 2. Two, three, four ERA in 19 postseason starts and helped three teams win a World Series. To me, he's a surefire, should have been first ballot Hall of Famer. Okay. Yeah. You and I could debate uh, the cheaters in Major League Baseball going into the Hall of Fame for an hour, but we don't have an hour. So I'm going to drag you back <laughs> onto the football field. Uh, glad you put your faith in the Lord. Shad Khan put his faith in Urban Meyer. 
How'd that work out for him? Um, uh, is Urban is Meyer, well as- is he ever going to coach again any place, anywhere, any level? Probably shouldn't. Uh, he's got nothing to gain. If he does come back into football, he'd be best suited for doing some some of the TV work that he was doing before that. But uh, he, he might be driven by the the taste of losing and the way things ended in Jacksonville. And he might want to write. I don't think he'll get another opportunity in the NFL. That's for sure. He may get an opportunity somewhere with a college program, and that might be an ego-driven thing. But uh, the Jaguars got to make a decision. It's an important decision. I'm glad that they're interviewing Doug Peterson. I'm glad that they're interviewing Byron Leftwich. I, I saw a list of uh, several, several names that they're going to be interviewing. So they got a tough decision to make. And I don't know how attractive that job is in Jacksonville. Yeah, you got Trevor Lawrence, but you got a, an organization that's uh, – their, their losing culture may far outweigh the uh, having Trevor Lawrence as your franchise quarterback. And if I'm a head coach with potential options, whether it's Chicago or Denver or Las Vegas, Jacksonville's got to be last on my list. I think they end up getting – a head coach who has no other option. And speaking of head coaches, last one for me, Rob, uh, JG, Shane Steichen. Uh, I'm going to put the number at one for each uh, over under. Do they get a head coaching interview? Oh, I think they get an interview. I don't think they get a job, but I, I think they both get an interview and, uh, I think we talked about a guy, Brian Johnson, early in the year, yeah. and, and I said I was impressed with him when I, when I saw him do a presentation for the NFL Quarterback Coaching Summit, and, and I thought that if Jalen Hurts has a, uh, a big year, he's going to get some credit for it, and he may get some interviews. It may be too soon right now uh, for his name to pop up, but uh, I think – Uh, He's a guy to keep an eye on because you kind of noticed that Jalen started to ascend a little bit when Brian Johnson was brought onto the field. Remember, he was up in the booth and now he was on the field. So I think he's a name who might also at some point get an interview. But but Gannon's certainly the one who who, will probably get it first. And I I love what he said yesterday about, hey, I'm in the moment and and Sirianni made, made it clear. He's not going to prevent anybody from from taking interviews, but that's something you needed to be prepared for before the season. Get your binder, get whatever it is you want to bring on on a coaching interview. Make sure you know what you're going to do, what you're going to say. Tweak it during the season, but don't be preparing for an interview three days before an important football game. You should have had that figured out already. Rob, last thing, just doubling back. Um, you think the Eagles are going to win against Washington this week, but a hard-fought game that will be decided in the last couple of minutes is the way you see it a couple of days out? Yeah, a couple of days out, Jody. I think it's going to be a struggle. I, I really do. It wouldn't shock me if they lose this game, but I think when they, when, when it all said and done, uh, they find a way to pull this one out. I, I think they're – the better football team than Washington. But I just think it's going to be a struggle. I think all the other pieces are going to fall into place for them. Uh, San Francisco should beat Houston, and, and, and Minnesota should lose to Green Bay. But uh, I think the Eagles are going to have a tough time with Washington, but ultimately get the job done and then lock up that playoff spot this week, which is something that I think should be applauded tremendously because we didn't see this coming at 2-5. and five. We didn't see this coming when everybody wanted Nick Sirianni fired because he made a flower analogy, uh, and and here they are. And I believe he deserves strong consideration, guys, for Coach of the Year. Wow, there we go. Serious consideration for 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 Coach for Coach of the Year to take this squad and and put them in the playoffs. Now, there's other candidates for sure, but I think Nick's going to get some votes, and he should get some votes. Mighty man, always great stuff. Appreciate it whenever you come on. We're still envious of the tan, but thank you very much for joining us, uh, these two white guys up here in Philadelphia. (laughs) Thanks for hopping on with us today, bud. Thanks, Rob. That's Rob Motti doing the Florida thing these days. But every time uh, you hop on uh, one of your little Zoom fests with the Eagles, Motti's always seeming to work in a question. So his heart is still here in Philadelphia, even if. His uh, body isn't these days. All right. McMullen and McDonald, last couple of minutes. We'll come back. We'll put a bow on the show here on Birds 360. 